Okay, welcome everybody to our Southern Maryland Audubon Society monthly lecture. Um, this evening, we are very, very um, lucky to have as our speaker, Chris Everly. And he will be talking about farmland raptors, a farmer's and birder's best friends. Uh, raptors are important indicators of environmental health. Raptors found in agricultural areas, farmland raptors, benefit farmers by preying on mice, voles, and insects. In Maryland, the barn owl and American kestrel are cavity nesting species breeding in Maryland that show widespread long-term declines. The short-eared owl and northern harrier are ground nesting species. The latter two are uncommon to rare breeders and occur in Maryland more often during the non-breeding months. All four species are a farmer's friend because they dine on many farm pests, including mice, grasshoppers, and voles. In fact, they can effectively and cheaply contribute to pest management, especially in fields. Attracting farmland raptors will significantly reduce the need for pesticides which can kill non-target animals in addition to intended rodents. And the sight of one of these raptors hunting adds an element of the wild back into your fields and delights birders. The presentation is about these raptors, their population status, causes for declines, and how community science efforts like the Farmland Raptor Program offer optimism about their future. Groups like Southern Maryland Audubon Society are poised to be leaders in this conversation, in this conservation program. And let me just tell you a bit about Chris. He is the executive director of the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership. A Marylander by birth, he worked in the computer industry for 11 years before attending graduate school at the University of Georgia. After graduating with an MS in natural resources and ornithology, Chris coordinated the Department of Defense's Bird Conservation Program, DOD's Partners in Flight Program, for 17 years. After serving as Executive Director of the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, ooh, very cool, <laughs> uh, he was excited to return to Maryland to head up NBCP. Chris strives to connect people to birds through Bird City, Maryland, Maryland Bald, Bald Eagle Nesting Mentor Monitoring Program, and the Farmland Raptor Program. He is also currently president of the Anne Arundel Bird Club. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Um, let me get my screen going. Well, good evening. Um, I'm really happy to be here talking with you guys. Um, obviously, anytime I get to talk about things I love, um, it's a fun, fun evening for me. Um, and I have a note here to introduce myself, which Jewel already did, but yes, my name is Chris Eberle. I always forget to do that, it seems. So yeah, only you can help farmland raptors and chimney swifts. And there's, I've got to give him a new name, but holding his uh, Kestrel box. The mission of the uh, Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership um, focuses on native wild bird populations and habitats and, and really looks to partnerships with public and private organizations to accomplish uh, conservation actions. And we also engage communities, which um, includes the individuals in that community. Um, and I consider uh, organizations like Southern Maryland Audubon Society its own community of sorts. What we envision is a Maryland landscape that's healthy and sustainable, not just for birds, but also for communities and those who live in them. And um, as you heard, what I like to do is try to connect birds, habitat, and people throughout the state. So I just want to start off with um, kind of the, the bad news, which um, Maybe you all have heard about, it was about a year ago that a report came out in Science about uh, what we're calling the bird crisis. That since 1970, it's actually a little more than one in four uh, birds gone. Uh, it's been 2.9 billion birds, uh, starting from a baseline of about 10 billion. Uh, so that's about 29% decline 
in the population of birds during the nesting season in North America, just in 50 years. A number of groups are suffering these declines, aerial insectivores, which are our swallows and swifts and nightjars. And here you can see um, barn swallows uh, have declined by 40%, two and five since 1970. Uh, swifts have lost even more. Um, the, the, uh, the two main swifts in the US, um, um, chimney and, and boxes uh, in the West uh, are down by more than 60%. Grassland birds have lost more than half of their population overall. And probably most alarming is um, Eastern Meadowlark. We, Eastern Meadowlark population is down by about 75% since 1950, nine, yeah, 1970. Migratory birds as a whole, which are all the birds that are now done nesting and heading south uh, for the winter where they have their ample food supply, uh, we've suffered about 30% loss overall with, with these migratory birds and near and dear to us, um, Baltimore Orioles are down by about 40% during that time period. However, the news isn't all bad. Um, raptors uh, have, have made some gains and that's largely thanks to efforts such as getting rid of DDT and other um, nasty pesticides that really uh, messed up the, uh, the food chain. Um, and waterfowl also have, have gone upwards in the last 50 years. <clears throat> so then we also have to talk about what, what's causing uh, mortality of birds. Uh, if we're losing that many birds, um, uh, cats is, you know, it's not something that's uh, easy to talk about, um, is very controversial, but the fact remains that free ranging cats uh, are the number one uh, human-induced mortality source for birds in North America. Um, window collisions, uh, actually that number is probably closer to a billion every year. These numbers are every year how many birds are lost to these uh, events. The good news is that same report generated um, a website called 3billionbirds.org and there is information on there about seven simple actions that you can take to help all birds. And I'll have a slide on that also at the end just to remind you, but 3billionbirds.org is a good place to go. I uh, just wanna hit briefly on Breeding Bird Atlas um, as a measure of bird population. So an atlas uh, is really looking at the distribution and relative abundance of bird populations in a state or in a county. And I say county because San Diego County did a breeding bird atlas where they documented 496 breeding species. In the second breeding bird atlas of DC and Maryland, uh, about 20 years ago, there were 206 documented species for the entire state. Uh, so breeding bird atlases can be done at, at any level, really, that you want to. Um, and this year, um, we just launched the third uh, breeding bird atlas for Maryland and the District of Columbia. And the uh, uh, data platform is eBird. Uh, so if you don't know much about the, the atlas portal for eBird, uh, you can go on to ebird.org and just search for uh, Maryland DC Breeding Bird Atlas 3. Uh, it shows up to the minute stats uh, um, with these counties, the number of confirmed species. Interestingly, Garrett County um, has more confirmed species after the first season uh, than anybody else. So, um, yeah, St. Mary's, Charles, not quite there yet, but I know you will get there. So now let's get into farmland raptors. Uh, this is a picture, it's in the a background, so it's got some transparency going on with it, but this is actually a Howard County farm uh, that shows what might be still good habitat for things like kestrels and uh, barn owls who, that looks like a really good barn for a barn owl to be nesting in. We have started this program called the Maryland Farmland Raptor Program to address not only kestrels and barn owls, but Northern Harrier and short-eared owls. 
So let me, let me go through each of these species, um, give some information about their population status um, and how we're looking to help these species. I have four short quizzes for you, which in person is a lot more fun because I can just stare down people and make them feel really uncomfortable. Um, but I like to understand bird names, especially the names in this for American kestrel. So the question is, does anybody think they know what Falcos, Falcos parvarius means? Where did that derive? So I'll just jump in. Uh, the genus name Falco comes from the Latin falx, F-A-L-X, which means a sickle um, that they would cut hay with, that kind of thing. And it's referring either to the long pointed scythe-like wings in flight or to the falcate or hooked bill and curved talons, or depending on the source, it could be all three. Uh, it's not 100% known where that, where that originated. The um, specific name of the species, Sparvarius, means pertaining to a sparrow, which refers to both the bird's small size and it has a propensity of hunting for small birds like sparrows. And the common colloquial name you may have heard of for the kestrel is, not surprisingly, the sparrow hawk. So one of the benefits of everybody using eBird for a lot of years now is that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has created animated abundance maps. And this is based on eBird data year round with uh, some pretty heavy duty modeling that goes on with it. Uh, so starting in January, you can actually see the movement of these birds. Uh, June, July, August, now the breeding season, after breeding season, where they go. So you can see just the pulsing of it. There are actually 13 kestrel species around the world. The American kestrel is the only one found in the Americas, which is the Western Hemisphere. But you can see there's good um, resident populations in uh, South America. And the Caribbean have several resident populations on different islands. And for the uh, um, American kestrel, there are as many as 17 recognized subspecies that range all the way from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego at the tip of South America. So let's just show this animation one more time so you get a sense of where, where the birds are going around our area. Uh, not a real common nester, but in the wintertime, you can see we get a lot more. There are a lot of good websites these days for a lot of different information. Uh, one that Cornell has uh, worked on is called nestwatch.org, and they have a section called All About Bird Houses. Uh, they do have information for kestrels and barn owls, not for um, harriers or, sol or uh, short-eared owls because they don't really use nest boxes. But that site gives you good information about the nesting habitat, where a nest box should be attached, uh, when the nesting is usually occurring, where to place the box, the hole size, entry hole size, which direction cardinally it should face, all that kind of thing. Some good information for um, any any bird that uses a bird house or nest box. Population wise, um, the kestrel as a whole is, is not really doing all that well. It is a species of greatest conservation need in the state wildlife action plans of 12 of the 14 northeastern states. Uh, in the southeastern US, it is not in decline, but the rest of the country, it is in decline. Uh, so the southeast, I'm not sure exactly why, there is a small area that has a southeastern American kestrel, uh, the Paulus subspecies, uh, that's year-round right there, and that's, I think, doing very well. Uh, and then just a lot of the birds coming in from the north in the wintertime may explain why uh, the declines are not noticed there. In terms of the atlas distribution from the, the last atlas, the second atlas, you can see generally these birds are found where there are agricultural lands. Um, the changes uh, from the 
first atlas, you can see in general, um, out of 1,284 atlas blocks, that's each one of these little, little blocks there, shaded blocks, uh, they were found uh, in a little more than half in the first atlas, but uh, down 30% from that. Uh, pretty, uh, yeah, uniformly with the confirmed probable possible. If we look at the changes, these are always very interesting to me. The red uh, triangles indicate blocks that had Kestrel uh, nesting confirmed or nesting evidence in the first atlas and not in the second atlas. So Kestrels were lost as breeders. The green circle is just the opposite where they were not found in the first atlas, but they now are found. You can see through the Piedmont, the middle uh, of the state, uh, western shore and up in this area, a lot of those red triangles. You can probably guess, based on the fact that these birds like open fields, this is where a lot of urbanization and development is happening, fragmentation. We're losing, we're losing agricultural fields and meadows, especially in these areas. Um, Partners in Flight has developed um, a pretty accurate assessment um, of estimating population size of bird species in North America. There's about 49, uh, 4,900,000 estimated in the global population size. So that would be uh, all those um, 17 subspecies from Alaska down to South America. There's an estimate of about 1,700 uh, birds in Maryland breeding. Uh, half of those would be in this bird conservation region uh, 30, which is uh, essentially we call it the coastal plain. Uh, so over half of the, the birds in the state are nesting in this area. Uh, the Piedmont area, um, about half as many as, as uh, in the coastal plain. But you can see here the Breeding Bird Survey trend information that in all of these areas, they've been declining since 1966. So it's pretty much statewide in uh, every physiographic uh, region in the state. So then the next question I always think of was, well, why? What's driving these declines? Well, there are a number of factors. There's really not one smoking gun, so to speak. Do you remember when West Nile virus hit? My gosh, that's been about, that's been 20 years now. Wow. Um, ground zero was right here. Uh, New York City area, uh, and then it slowly made it spread uh, northward and then westward. Um, a lot of bird species were hit hard initially with that and knocked back the populations. They, they now have, I guess, built up sort of an immunity um, somewhat uh, to West Nile virus, but it, it's still out there, just not nearly as bad right now. Uh, another thing, why are kestrels declining? Well, Cooper's hawks are increasing. And here you can see a Cooper's hawk feasting on a kestrel. Um, that's good for the Cooper's hawk, but not for the kestrels. So if we look at the breeding bird Alice changes in, in Cooper's hawks uh, between the mid-80s and the mid-2000s, um, <laughs> Look at the change, um, the number, the percent change of breeding in the Atlas blocks increased by 226 percent, uh, 396 additional blocks. So they went from uh, confirmed or nesting evidence in 175 blocks to 571. Cooper's hawks have really adapted to urban living. Um, if you have bird feeders, you might also see Cooper's hawks hanging out at your bird feeders. Just like birds that have their route of uh, bird feeders they go to, the Cooper's hawks have their route too to pick off the birds at those bird feeders. And this again, that interesting map showing the green circles where there are new blocks in the second atlas with Cooper's hawk nesting that were not there in the first. So you can see uh, largely these areas where kestrels have started to fade out a little bit, but pretty much statewide Cooper's hawks are just on the up and up. And the breeding bird survey route uh, results show this increase that's really in the last 20 years showing a, a more significant uptick. 
Another reason that's uh, affecting um, grassland birds in general are uh, pesticides. Um, there's been a lot of news about um, uh, the, um, oh, the, the neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids um, and the impact they have. Uh, diazinon, uh, carbifurans, um, they're just, just bad things for birds, bad things for people. Uh, they're kind of pervasive in the environment uh, and that's something we need to keep working on. And lastly, you know, here again, this is another Maryland farm that might be good habitat for a kestrel, but little by little, urbanization is taking out those fields and we're putting in subdivisions. Um, and that's not good for any bird that needs open, open land. A group in New Jersey had put up, I think over 500 kestrel nest boxes and not just monitored them for uh, breeding success, but then they did measurements on the habitat type uh, around the nest boxes. And you can see crops and pastures, these open farmlands and meadows, half, half of the nest boxes that were successful were placed in those areas. Uh, nest box placed in other areas generally were not quite as successful. So again, the message here is they need these croplands, pasture lands, meadows. Quiz number two for the barn owl, Taito alba. So Taito literally, Taito alba literally means white owl. Um, Taito is Greek for night owl actually. And then the Latin alba means white. So it describes the white underparts that make one of these birds flying at night look ghostly white against the night sky. So the barn owl is, is one of these widespread around the globe kind of species. It's found uh, on virtually every continent except uh, Antarctica. Uh, a lot of the islands, uh, you can find these things too. So they're pretty much um, worldwide and as a whole not doing badly uh, because they're so widely spread. Now barn owls are very interesting too because they actually um, have been used as a symbol of peace uh, in the Middle East. Now this is uh, looking at uh, Jordan and Israel uh, and the Palestinian territories. There was a program that these are all uh, nest locations of nest boxes for barn owls. Uh, and here is one landowner <laughs> that has a box with a barn owl that that's, uh, was nesting in it and there they're checking it. This is Yossi Leshem, who is an Israeli legend. Um, he is like Mr. Ornithology in Israel. I, I've had the pleasure of meeting him and he's just one of those people, he'll talk forever and he knows everything about everything. Uh, great sense of humor though too, but he really was instrumental in getting this program going. And, and I just love this picture. Uh, a barn owl reared in Israel. Um, you can see Tel Aviv, Israel on the leg band. Um, they formed a breeding pair with a barn owl raised in Jordan. So these are legs from the two different birds. And here you can see Jordan on this leg band. So if that's not the ultimate in um, Middle East peace accords, uh, I really don't know what else could be. Looking at uh, barn owl distributions, again, this is not really a migratory species. They just have short movements. And again, you can see resident populations in South America, some in Central America as well, um, and also in the Caribbean here. Uh, but, you know, you can see barn owls are doing pretty well out in the West, um, some areas of uh, the Midwest, not a whole lot. Uh, in the Northeast. And just again, some information from all about birdhouses on the nestwatch.org site. I uh, encourage you to go there to find a lot of good stuff about, about birds and nest boxes. The global population side is estimated to be 1.8 million birds. Uh, the Maryland population, we really don't know. <laughs> 
globally, the population size, the threats to, or the breeding distribution and the non-breeding distribution are really not an issue. Uh, low score, this is from one to five. A score of one means really no, no problems, no threats. A uh, score of five is the highest uh, threat. Continentally, uh, that means pretty much uh, the US and Canada, the threats to breeding habitat, threats to non-breeding habitat are right in the middle. Uh, so habitat loss uh, is, is um, an issue. And then the population trend, um, is a two out of five, which means it's really not bad. Overall, um, they're having a 50% increase in population. However, um, as we saw from that animated abundance map, um, there weren't that many birds in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, uh, and they are in fact declining there. Uh, but one of the problems uh, we have is just having good protocols to actually know how many birds are out there. You have to do specialized protocols. The breeding bird survey is really not going to catch barn owls. Uh, so that, that remains a problem is, is essentially a lack of data. So looking at the atlas, in the first atlas, there were 52 blocks that had evidence of breeding for barn owls. Uh, by the second atlas, you can see a lot of those blocks disappeared. Now, one thing I will point out, um, and here are showing the changes between the first and second atlas, like 70% drop in the number of um, atlas blocks with uh, breeding evidence. The first atlas, there was somebody who was uh, making a concerted effort to go around the state and do special surveys seeking out barn owls. Uh, the second atlas, that effort was um, not nearly as strong. So some of this might actually be due to just effort as opposed to uh, definitive a 70% loss in the population. And you can see we you know, lost a lot of blocks in there. Uh, so overall about 72% change in the number of blocks, but we'll see the third atlas has just begun. Um, it's, uh, this was the first of five field seasons. Um, so another plug, get out there and participate in the Breeding Bird Atlas. Go out and look for these barn owls in your area. Northern Harrier. Um, it's actually pronounced Circus. Uh, Circus Hudsonius. Um, circus derives from the Greek word kirkos, which means a circle. Uh, which is a name that Aristotle and other classic authors used to mean a type of hawk, very generic. Um, and then that circus also, they described the hawk's habitat, habit of circling in the sky as it hunts. Uh, maybe not necessarily what a harrier does, but a hawk in general, a type of hawk. Um, Hudsonius, oh, I actually didn't research that. Um, <laughs> Probably because somebody named Hudson was the one that found it. Um, until 2017, uh, the Harrier, Northern Harrier, was considered conspecific with the Hen Harrier in Eurasia. In 2017, it was split out into its own species, and the Hen Harrier uh, now is the one that has Circus cyaneus, which means cyaneus is blue-gray. And the hen harrier now has that, and um, northern harrier is now a uh, North American bird uh, with Circus hudsonius. So they like marsh grasslands uh, is one of their favorite habitats. Open grasslands with sedges and tall grasses in there. They they will build a platform nest on just on the ground, but a little bit elevated. Uh, generally because they're in wetter areas. Um, not a real common breeder in Maryland. The first or the, uh, the second breeding bird atlas, you can see in general, they're down in the lower eastern shore. Um, the change from the first atlas, you can see there's been losses in Dorchester County, which is just losing a lot of, <laughs> a lot of everything to sea level rise. Uh, some of the birds down here in uh, Somerset, Wacomico, um, 
seem to have migrated over more toward the barrier islands, Chincoteague and those areas. But in general, not a lot of nesting uh, with the harrier in the state of Maryland. Globally, um, a pretty good population size, 1.6 million. Um, in Maryland, there's an estimate of just about 100 birds uh, in the breeding season. And 90% uh, of that is in the, uh, the coastal plain. Now, these numbers here, the population trend, uh, four out of five, uh, they've experienced a 37% decline in population since 1970. Uh, and then here is an interesting thing, the, the breeding bird survey half-life, which means in 148 years, it's estimated that this bird will decline by another 50% from where it is now. Uh, breeding bird survey, again, maybe not real well uh, in detecting harriers. Uh, this number here is the number of birds per survey route, which is 50 stops about uh, a quarter mile apart. So you can see uh, about 0 0.05 birds per route in Maryland. Um, and as we noticed, they're all kind of in the lower eastern shore. US-wide, similar thing, um, you know, less than half uh, 0.5 detections per route in the U.S., but you can see U.S.-wide a general decline. Maryland may be a slight decline, but there's so few birds we really can't get an accurate trend on that. The abundance map with harriers uh, I think is a good example to see as we get into the breeding season. Uh, you can see right here just a little bit in that lower eastern shore region. In the wintertime, we get a lot more coming in. Uh, to, to spend the winter months, um, which I'm sure we all are aware of. You can see how they're uh, heading out, up north and west, and then back in the wintertime, and we have some good numbers of them. Short-eared owl, uh, Azio flamius. Um, so Azio is the, the genus name, is, is Latin for a kind of horned owl. Uh, again, kind of a generic. Those, those people liked uh, Latin and Greek names. They liked these generic names. Flameus is Latin for flame-colored or fiery, which is probably a little bit of an overstatement um, describing the tawny cinnamon buff coloration of the short-eared owl. So this bird likes, uh, similar to kestrels, likes um, these open areas, open fields uh, to hunt. Um, in Maryland, um, <laughs> in the first atlas, there were no blocks that had evidence of short-eared owls nesting. By the second atlas, we had one uh, out here uh, in Allegheny County. I think that was around Dan's Mountain. Uh, so again, a uh, very rare breeder uh, in Maryland, more common uh, in the wintertime. Population-wise, 3.3 million birds estimated for the global population size Maryland. We really don't know because we've only had one in the atlas. Uh, and again, uh, Breaking Bird Survey is not going to really pick up this bird. Uh, the big number here with the population estimates database that Partners of Flight did is a, is a population trend of five. Uh, which is the highest uh, in the bad sense, that uh, short-eared owls have undergone a, about a 65% population decline since 1970. In terms of breeding bird atlas, um, you can kind of see nationwide, or this is actually range-wide, uh, U.S. and Canada, um, yeah, maybe 0.1 detections per breeding bird survey route. So again, breeding bird survey may not really do very well in detecting how many birds are out there. Um, Maryland, there, I mean, this whole region here, the Northeast, the Southeast, the Midwest, and getting a little bit into the Southwest, um, there's just not enough data um, to calculate even any kind of trend with the breeding bird survey. So again, breeding bird survey may be not our best way to, to look at this. In terms of um, 
uh, abundance. There is so little data. <laughs> they have this little caveat. Uh, certain products may be unavailable due to insufficient data. So there's so little data for the breeding season, they don't even have a static map of estimated abundance during the breeding season. The best uh, that the eBird uh, data can come up with is this map showing the non-breeding uh, distribution based on eBird surveys. So one thing I wanna mention here that I came across in researching um, farmland raptors, uh, there's this area called the Great Valley of Eastern North America. And that, that kind of stands out as critical habitat for the management of grassland birds, including kestrels and barn owls. Um, and it, it maintains uh, to this day a focus on agriculture. This, this yellow triangle is uh, about where Hagerstown is, just to give you some indication of, of the geography here. Uh, but this Great Valley landscape has really not experienced the same pressures uh, from development and secondary succession of, from losing uh, grassland habitats. Um, so it is still, um, pretty good area for barn owls, kestrels, and other grassland birds. You know, if we, if we want to really look at, you know, where the habitat loss is occurring, you know, some of those maps we showed where kestrels are disappearing is right through here. And you can see the red being developed land, uh, Baltimore, the Washington DC area, this corridor here is where all the development is happening, where we're losing habitats and others are being fragmented. So it's really no surprise that a lot of open grassland birds are just not going to be around in that area like they might have been 50 years ago. So that kind of gave rise to this program we're calling the Maryland Farmland Raptor Program. Um, and I, I, I know Lynn has been involved in this um, and, and Julie, so we're we're already, uh, you guys are already uh, foot in the door on, on the ground floor, and I'm very happy about that. The purpose of this whole program is really to look at how we can stabilize and actually begin to increase farmland raptor populations in Maryland. Uh, so uh, we have recovery goals that are looking at, first, we need to assess the population. As we saw, there's just, some of these birds are really hard to get solid numbers on, so we need to have a concerted effort around the state of Maryland to, to really find out how many birds are there during the breeding season, during the non-breeding season. Look at how we can identify, protect, and restore some of these critical grassland habitats and uh, grassland marsh type of habitats. And where we can for kestrels and barn owls, we need to really look at increasing the availability of nest sites. And when we talk about nest sites for these birds, we're really talking about uh, putting up nest boxes uh, where the habitat is is suitable. And a big part of any t any program like this is really getting the public to understand these birds need our help, uh, identifying to the public what types of habitats are out there, and to potential landowners where we can work with them on putting up nest boxes, identifying where these potential areas are, educating those landowners and helping those landowners put up and monitor these boxes where we can. So here are some pictures of uh, existing programs. The Calvert, uh, Calvert County has had a really good program uh, with barn owls and this is, you know, at the edge of waterways where there's some marsh area, they have found that barn owls are actually taking the nest boxes very readily in, in that habitat. Uh, kestrel boxes on a tree. You can also put them on fence posts. Uh, here you can see one of them and the inside. I mean, who is not going to fall in love with um, <laughs> little baby kestrels, fuzzy little barn owls, that kind of thing. And we talk about existing habitat that we want to identify and protect. Uh, barns and silos for barn owls. That is habitat for them. So I want to just, I think we have time. Let me just go into a sort of complementary program with the Farmland Raptor program, and that is working with chimney swifts. So I guess there are five quizzes tonight. Uh, Kitora pelagica. Kitora is a combination of two ancient Greek words, uh, kaite, which means bristle or spine. And if you've never seen a close up view of chimney or boxes swifts, those are both of the Kitora species. 
they have these spines uh, at the tail. And uh, the other combination is aura. So kaite aura. And aura means tail. So literally it means spiny tail. Uh, pelagica is derived from the Greek word pelagikos, which means of the sea. But really what this is thought to be is referring to not necessarily a reference to the ocean, the sea, but rather its nomadic lifestyle, uh, that it wanders widely. Uh, it will nest in, in our area um, and it will spend the winter um, down in the Amazon basin for the most part. Um, Looking at the abundance during the nesting season, you can see for the eastern half of the United States, it's pretty evenly distributed, uh, fair abundance. Um, so there's, you know, on the surface, it looks good. If you were to look at Vox's Swift, they're, they're pretty much over here in the western United States. Um, looking at the uh, animated abundance map, you can see they pretty much are all gone from the U.S. And here they come in the nesting season and then at the end of the nesting season they gather together in these huge pre-migratory flocks and roosts and then head down and you can see it disappears out of uh, central and northern south america uh, we'll get the end of nesting again and you can see they're heading down and very quickly they end up in the in the amazon basin which is off of the map here not many people do ebert i guess in the amazon basin um, population trend-wise, um, you can see it's, it's just not, uh, <laughs> not a happy picture here. Uh, breeding bird survey route will show trends uh, over time, and this is since 1966 when the breeding bird survey route really got kicked off. Most of these areas are um, uh, but probably between 3 and 25% decline per year. Um, so we can see here negative 2.19 trend. So what we're seeing is basically a loss of 2.19% per year, which, which uh, and then just recently in the last, uh, from 2005 to 2015, it's been even higher. Um, so it's a pretty severe decline. The IUCN, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has listed this bird as vulnerable. Um, so it's on the red list as vulnerable for the IUCN. Um, that's generally not a good thing to be on that list. And looking at the overall population in Maryland, um, estimated almost 100,000 birds in Maryland out of 8.8 .8 million globally. Uh, which is basically U.S. and Canada, and and similar um, to kestrels and barn owls, the bulk of those, 60 percent, are are in the coastal plain of Maryland. Uh, the population size, the breeding distribution, and the non-breeding distribution are really not major threats globally. Continentally, the threats to breeding habitat are four out of five. And what is breeding habitat for a chimney swift? It's a chimney. Uh, it's not a natural area. Uh, we're losing chimneys, uh, new construction going up. Uh, they're capping chimneys. The chimneys they're putting in now are not suitable for swifts in general. And they are really not doing well. Population trend of five. They have lost 67% of their population since 1970. Uh, it is on the, the watch list uh, under the category of we need to prevent further declines in this. This half-life, um, again, not a good sign. It is estimated at the current trend that in 27 years, we will lose an additional 50% of the current population. And looking at the breeding bird atlas distribution, you can see, again, pretty well distributed across the state. Uh, not surprisingly, where we saw all that urbanization and development that's where there's going to be more chimneys. That's where we're going to find more chimney swifts um, for the most part. Um, not a whole lot of loss, but where we have lost birds, uh, it's been uh, lower eastern shore and far out western Maryland. So one interesting fact about chimney swifts, no matter how big or how small a chimney or uh, a chimney swift tower, there is only ever one nesting pair 
of chimney swifts in there. There may be a bird or two or three that will roost in there, but they're not nesters. Uh, you will only ever find one nest per chimney, uh, which is pretty significant then when you think about if we're losing a chimney, uh, that, that is actually an entire nesting substrate for one potential pair of birds. One of the neat things, which uh, if you haven't seen uh, the fall spectacle of what we call pre-migratory roosts, this one is up in Ontario. Uh, there are probably, the I think, the estimate they made from this, there are about 6,000 <laughs> birds here. <laughs> they are packed in. Uh, a smaller chimney will have, you know, maybe a couple hundred. Uh, but the neat thing is, um, when you can see them coming into one of these roost chimneys right at dusk. It is one of the most incredible spectacles, I think, in the entire natural world. Um, and if you can find one, uh, right now is a good time because they have not left yet. Uh, some have, but they are still getting into these um, large groupings in pre-migratory roost chimney setups. Uh, it, it's like watching a tornado forming and then watch that tornado start to go down a chimney. Uh, it is just an amazing spectacle. I had the fortune of being out in Portland, Oregon for a meeting one fall, and there is an elementary school uh, at, at, in one of the suburbs of Portland where the whole hillside is lined with people from the community. These are not necessarily bird watchers, but people bring their picnic baskets out and make an evening of it every evening during the time when Voxes Swift come in. And the estimate for the number of Voxes Swift in that chimney, uh, I think was 12,000. And I'll tell you that, that just, when the first Swift went into the chimney, the entire hillside erupted. People were just, I mean, it's just the most amazing things. Anybody can get so excited about this thing. So one of the things we want to do uh, to create more nesting habitat are build these swift towers uh, in areas um, where there is, again, appropriate um, foraging habitat uh, and other habitat. Uh, they can be freestanding like this. This is a bigger tower that was probably put on, uh, looks like somewhere up in New England, perhaps, uh, as a, a roost chimney for these pre-migratory roosts. So our Chimney Swift Conservation Program, very similar purpose uh, and goals to the farmland raptor. You know, we want to help stabilize uh, this, this drastic 67% decline in the population and try to begin to increase Chimney Swift populations. Recovery goals, again, we really, I, what we hope to do is, is in assessing the population is really try to assess how many chimneys throughout the state are being used uh, by chimney swifts, uh, both for nesting and for these pre-migratory roosts. Uh, we want to increase the availability of nest sites, and that can mean uh, helping to educate homeowners about making sure their chimneys are available as nesting chimneys for swifts. Um, and again, and where we can, we'll put up these artificial chimneys, which are these swift towers. And like everything else, public awareness is just huge uh, with this kind of thing. Um, so um, those are uh, the things that we are looking to do for farmland raptors, for chimney swifts. Um, back to these seven uh, simple things. Uh, make windows safer. And um, Safe Skies Maryland website has information. American Bird Conservancy website has information on how you can uh, essentially treat or retrofit your windows so that you reduce the potential of birds uh, colliding into your window. They're either seeing, their uh, seeing the reflection of a tree or shrub or open sky uh, in the window, or they're seeing through it, depending on the lighting, to maybe a tree or a, a, a a shrub on the other side of your house. Uh, do community science. So that is farmland raptor program, chimney swift program, bald eagle nest monitoring program, helping with monitoring uh, important bird areas, uh, which I know a couple of you uh, uh, on this call do. Um, 
getting getting the community engaged to help out is really good. Um, the cats we talked about, we won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> it's a big problem though. Plastics are just still a huge problem, especially single use plastics. So we're trying to encourage people to avoid all the single use plastics like straws, these shopping bags, uh, plastic cups and utensils. These things get into the waterways and especially plastic bags. Uh, get get out into the oceans, kill uh, seabirds, whales, turtles, and you know microplastics. You've probably heard about. They're pretty much in everybody's uh, everybody's body in the world at this point. They're so pre prevalent in the in the ecosystems. Plant more native uh, plants. They're better for birds. Uh, birds evolved with native plants, not uh, these ornamental things, uh, ornamental shrubs and trees. You don't have to mow or water as much, use less fertilizer, less pesticides. Shade grown coffee. Um, I'll put a shameless plug in here. <laughs> we, we have a partnership with Birds and Beans Coffee, um, which I think I've been drinking that for probably 20 years and I, I, you know, I'm a little biased. I think it's probably the best coffee out there. Shade grown coffee, think of it as similar to like vine ripened tomatoes. Uh, the coffee bean is actually a berry on a bush. The nuts inside, the seeds are really what are ground up. So the, a vine ripened fruit of any kind is just going to be uh, better, more robust, um, better coffee. It helps small farmers. Um, they can sustain this small coffee plantation year after year because they're guaranteed an income with this stuff and then just reduce pesticide use and all that helps the ecosystems in the tropics where this is grown. And at least 42 species of Orioles, warblers, thrushes uh, are known to spend the uh, non-breeding season on these coffee plantations. And as I mentioned before, the neonics, uh, any kind of pesticides, uh, DDT in the past, you know, we saw how bad that was. Uh, we're still doing it today. Uh, we, we just need to really cut back on the use of pesticides in our environment. So with that, I thank you for inviting me here tonight and welcome you to join us in doing what we all can do to help Maryland's birds. So at this point, um, I will unshare my screen and we can, uh, if, if people want to stick around for questions, I'll be here as long as people are still talking to me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh, I learned so much. I loved your maps. Those were cool. That's the geek in me. <laughs> um, I enjoy doing presentations like this because it's just, I mean, it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, and people do, they learn so much. And Part of it is there are simple things that you can do to help, you know, get involved um, and just do things to benefit birds. And anything we do to benefit birds in the end is going to benefit us because we're making the ecosystem healthier, which we also live in that same ecosystem. That's absolutely right. And, and that's why we at Audubon support uh, Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership programs so wholeheartedly. Um, I mean, we fit together. We, right. we all share these same goals. And um, Lou I reminded a... me on the chat here. I, I saw that uh, that um, Lynn has been involved with this uh, kind of the startup uh, committee of the Farmland Raptor Program, and Southern Maryland Audubon is going to uh, foot the bill for a brochure that we're putting together that uh, that we want to have available for private landowners, farmers, um, just to help educate them, show them what's available and the opportunity they can have to help these birds. So uh, thank you uh, to Southern Maryland Audubon uh, for that level of involvement, which is huge uh, to be able to get some printed materials available uh, for people. Yes, we are very excited to do that and get the word out um, amongst our own uh, farmers too down here. Um, yes, exactly. And you have, you have some good potential areas there. Yeah, we do. And um, I, I had so many connecting ideas here. While folks are thinking of more questions, um, before I forget, I thought, because there is 
one or two in the chat so far, but I'd like us to get a, a couple more. Um, but I, I did want to ask you um, if you wanted to mention um, World Migratory Bird Day this week. Oh my gosh, how could I forget that? Well, <laughs> They, well, we we are participating, <laughs> yes. and and I want and I would like people to join us um, for the Maryland Bird Day Live. That we're having a session uh, from La Plata that's going to be on uh, Friday, October 9th at six p.m. And I think you guys are doing that Facebook Live or something. I don't know how they're going to. Yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of of Zoom and then also on Facebook Live. Uh, yeah, we're, we're actually starting tomorrow night uh, with uh, the Owl Happy Hour. Um, that, that's going to be a really fun program with... Um, I'll wear my shirt. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So Scott Widensall and Dave Brinker, who uh, those two uh, were essentially co-founders in Project Owlnet and Project Snowstorm. So they're going to talk about uh, and be joined by uh, Melissa Boyle Acuity. Uh, who does the solid owl banding for them um, down at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Uh, so it's just going to be uh, kind of an informal discussion, a lot of question and answer opportunity. And then, yeah, the program is Friday, um, and we're, we're excited about the La Plata uh, thing <laughs> for several reasons. La Plata was the first bird city in Maryland, um, and Yay! La Plata officially adopted the Purple Martin as its town bird. Um, so we are having uh, the La Plata segment at six o'clock, and then at six thirty, the Global uh, Migratory Bird Day Bird Day Live is going to have uh, a speaker talking about purple martins on the wintering ground in Brazil. So it'll be a nice segue about your local breeding martins and then where they go in the winter time. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. So yeah, six o'clock Friday, you can go to. Um, birdcitymaryland.org uh, and then look for the uh, the Bird Day Live uh, events that will have information on uh, the details how you can get connected with that. And then Saturday morning we're doing a Saturday morning coffee house. Um, awesome. Nine o'clock we're going to have Bill Wilson, the founder of Birds and Beans Coffee, uh, Paul Basich, who probably knows everybody, everybody knows him and he oh. loves everything. So um, just talking about Shea Grown Coffee, we're going to have Justine Bow from the um, Bird Friendly Coffee Program at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center as well. So yeah, join us for Bird Day, Maryland Bird Day Live this weekend. So that's very exciting and very cool. I'm so pleased that we'll be able to play a part in that with you. Yeah, look, that, that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we mentioned the brochure. And I also want to get in a plug before everyone uh, disperses for our next um, online lecture. And it's going to be Wednesday, November 4th, the day after the general election. Easy to remember. <laughs> and um, we are having, let me, let me pull it up here for us. Um, oh, drat, I lost it. Um, Amanda Gallinat is going to be talking uh, with us. She is a um, professor and researcher, and she's going to be talking about um, abundance of fruit bearing plants and how they affect bird migration with climate change. So that's going to be a oh, really, good. really interesting program. And um, I invite everyone to come and join us um, again next month. Uh, we may well have something else added um between now and then but we'll let you know online if so and let me just pop down um the question also so I, I, do, see... I do see one from jane here if that's in the chimney swift one mm -hmm. yeah so did chimney swifts require masonry chimneys or are they capable of building a nest in a metal chimney um they need something to cling on to so Chimney swifts are in the family Apodidae, which basically means no feet. Um, they do have feet, but they can't perch. They have, um, uh, I, I, should, I should write this name down, I forget it, but some kind of dactyl toes. <laughs> they have um, the ones in the front, one in the back, and they can swing the one in the back up to the front just so they just cling onto the side of masonry chimneys because they're rough and they can do that. When we build chimney swift towers, 
we have to have uh, rough wood surface on on the inside for them to be able to actually mm -hmm. cling on to um, with their little toes. Uh, so uh, a lot of these like metal chimneys when they're when chimneys are retrofitted for a gas fireplace or things like that, that takes it out of the picture for swifts to be able to nest in because they can't hold on to a smooth surface like that. Uh, so yeah, they need, it, it's really a matter of what they can hang on to. Uh, when they build the nest, they use their saliva, which is, is kind of like an avian super glue when it dries. Uh, but if they can't cling on to it, then they can't actually build the nest there. I'm looking here and um... Zygodactyl. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. Thank Is you. Is that the one? That's it. I'm going to yeah. copy that and paste it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions in here at the moment, but um, I'm really glad you were able to fit in the chimney swift part of the presentation tonight because my secret wish is that we would be able to somewhere in our Southern Maryland region put up a tower uh, for chimney swifts. It's something it, I would love to see that roosting behavior too. That's that's on my list. That's yeah, on my and, and I don't know if yeah. there are, if there are any larger chimneys in La Plata or, or anywhere else. If anybody has seen that um, around the area, but it, yeah, it, it's a it should be a bucket list thing for any birder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on my list, and um, well, I'd be also, glad to work with you on on a chimney swift tower, um, kind of locating a good area for it, and finding how we can get the materials and get it built. That would be awesome. Yeah, we I think we're going to have to work on a partnership for that, but that's, that's yep. in the back of our minds. And also, if you know of anyone who could talk to us uh, in more depth about chimney swifts, I'd love to. I'd love to schedule someone. Okay. Um, that's oh uh, oh Jane says the old Leonard Town Library. I think ah, okay. I think that might be a suggestion for a place that has a chimney, maybe. Yeah. Jane, do you know are they um roosting there now? I think we have to wait for them to type to type it in, yeah. They she didn't, doesn't have they the didn't microphone. Have a mic. Uh because that yeah, and, and they don't always use the same roost chimneys every this you know year to year. They they mm -hmm. might move it around. Now the larger these roofs get. Uh, like I think Richmond, there's this one in old industrial chimney um, that they get about 6,000 or so every year. And as they move south, the groups get larger and larger because they're merging together. So they need these bigger and bigger chimneys. Wow. So that's cool. kind of, if you want to, okay, haven't been there this year, happened once before. Last miles talk. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, now's the time. Um, you got maybe another week or two. <laughs> uh, and then like that animated map showed, they just whoop, they're gone. They're gone fast. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I saw six of them at uh, Smallwood State Park and I was surprised. I was surprised they were even still here then. But... Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're hanging around. Um, it'll be another couple of weeks probably, but when, when they decide to all go, they all go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I don't see any more questions. Um, if, unless you have something else to say, I think, uh, no, I we'll think I've talked, I've talked everybody's ear off. So, uh, <laughs> um, you guys probably know how to get a hold of me, um, director at marylandbirds.org or just ask Lynn. She knows my phone number too. <laughs> Excellent. Right. And for, and for anyone else who, who missed part of this or had to drop out or come back or, uh, I will be posting this, se this session of our lecture series on our website under our work, uh, program archive. So it'll be up there in the next day or two. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed yeah. this. This was really fun. Take yep. care. All right. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.